So hi, I'm Chip. I'm the CEO of Claypot AI, and I like my coffee with oat milk and no sugar. I don't know why you order cappuccino sometimes; it just give you sugar. I just don't get it, but I feel great pain. This new, my man. You're in Martha's Vineyard right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> and is it an actual vineyard? Did you figure that one out? I have not spent time cracking that conundrum quite yet. <laughs> Not quite yet. No, maybe by the end of this trip. Maybe, maybe. We'll see what I have time to get to. <laughs> nice. Well, this, I mean, we say this all the time, like this was a legendary podcast. This was incredible. But I think this time we outdid ourselves because we got none other than Chip Yuen on the podcast. Finally, I've been trying to get her on the podcast for probably like a year and a half now and the stars align dude what did you think i mean it was chip is one of the most uh, notable ml experts out there her thoughtful blog posts not to mention her uh, stanford classes and and the various mm-hmm. programs that she teaches and it was just awesome to interview her i mean i got to say way to go with the persistence and one thing I realized, so I thought everybody knew Chip. I would expect if you're in MLOps, you know Chip. I asked Mederick, uh, shout out to him. He's organizing the Luxembourg local community that we're getting started. And I said, hey man, I'm about to interview Chip. Do you have any questions? Because he was mentioning that he uh, listens to the podcast. And he told me, who's Chip? <laughs> and I was like, hey, "What? You don't know? It's a beautiful what, thing really? to discover. It's a beautiful thing to discover an expert you didn't know about. And learn more about it." Yep. So, for those who do not know, Chip uh, obviously did everything that Vishnu said, but she also was working at Snorkel before she set out, and now she is the CEO of a company called Claypot AI. And this conversation was brilliant, man. There were so many cool ways that she looks at things. For me, I will say my favorite was probably when she talked about how she likes to learn and how she likes to force herself, basically put herself into situations that she knows will make her learn. It reminded me of this video I saw from uh, this guy named Johnny Harris. I don't know if you saw that video. It's like these forcing functions and how you can basically like supercharge your learning And it is by doing that, like by putting yourself into a situation that you know you either have some kind of responsibility to others to learn or there's this like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like accountability on you. So you have to learn. And yeah, that was awesome. What about you? What were some takeaways? I know we talked a ton about streaming. That's her big thing these days. Yep. Anything from And that's there? exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. Nice. Just to sort of reiterate, Chip is a leading expert on machine learning and building machine learning systems. She's the author of the recent O'Reilly book, Designing Machine Learning Systems. She's taught courses at Stanford. She worked at Snor- Snorkel, as uh, Dimitrios has said, a uh, speaker at multiple notable conferences, including uh, Scale AI's TransformX conference. And she is an expert on streaming. That's what her company focuses on. And my favorite part of the podcast was when she would walk through what streaming machine learning is like. And her point that it's not that hard when you really think about it. It's not that big of a mental well, barrier to cross. Hard. I think it was like, this is simple in theory, but maybe it's more complicated in practice. And that's exactly where her perspective is, well, we just need the tools and that's what I'm going to go do, which I appreciate it. I think her walkthrough of the streaming paradigm was very helpful and is probably the highlight of the episode for me because of, you know, how technical it got and how much it helped me understand streaming. And and for those who are interested in learning more, I would recommend checking out her website and seeing the recent post that she wrote about streaming and introduction to streaming for data scientists. Yes. And... We could probably, we'll try and get Chip to give us some free books that we can give out to people. So if you want to leave us a review or leave us a comment on YouTube and let us know that you want some free books, then uh, we'll see if O'Reilly will give us some. Otherwise, we will buy them ourselves with all that good sponsor money we got coming through. And man, let's just get into it because it was fun. Uh, For anybody, that 
is listening, you know what would be super helpful for us is if you shared this episode with a friend that you think would be interested. And as we mentioned before, leave a review and give us a like, all that good stuff. It makes a world of difference to the algorithm and we want as many people to see this as possible. All right, let's jump into it. I want to ask the first question. And the first question I want to ask is, <laughs> let's, how, how am I going to phrase this? All right. So, Chip, you have a Discord server and a lot of people hit me up and they ask me about stuff that's going on in your Discord server because they think that it's called the MLOps community. And then we also have something called the MLOps community. So can we just settle this forever, ever right now? Can we call it something else? Your Discord server, can we just figure out a different name for it? And then we will run with that so that <laughs> people don't you have know, to hit me up. This remind me of when Kanye West wanted to trade Mars with music, you know? You know, like, it's a community, <laughs> it's ML Ops. I don't know. I said, maybe we just call it ML Ops community because we were too lazy to name it. You know, it's very <laughs> casual. We do the mean to like, it's not even like an organization. It's not registered anywhere. It's just like, we just like way too lazy to, to come up with a name. So yes, name suggestions. Like if you have any good names, then yes. I don't know. We have to do that like every every few months. I would be like, "What should we name our community?" <laughs> and I was just like, "No idea." Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm just saying it because sometimes I'll get hit up by people like, "Oh, there's this cool thing that uh, Eugene Yan's doing in the MLOps community. Where can I sign up?" He's great. I'm isn't like, he? I would love for Eugene Yen to be doing something with us, but I think you're a little bit confused here. Eugene just did one thing with us and then I haven't heard from him since. So there's a new name. We got to figure out a new name and we'll, uh, yeah, we are I guess taking it'll name be suggestions. Yeah, like we're taking name suggestions. We have a discussion like every month, trust, trust me. Trust. There we uh, go. So, so <laughs> you wasn't real, yeah. Have, like, for us, yeah. we are not like, we just like, yes, we just, a bunch of like people who just gather on Discord. We, we it's not it's not really like a, I don't know it's not really an organization. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, that being said, it is awesome what you're doing, and I think you're sharing a ton of cool stuff in that Discord for anybody out there that is not involved in it. Go check it out. We're hopefully going to separate the names and so we'll call it the discord ml ops or the slack ml ops we gotta we gotta figure out something and we're open to suggestions and so tweet at us tweet at chip yeah. next question i have is you are like the incredible no, probably the most prolific evangelist out there when it comes to ml ops oh. you spend a ton of time I would imagine just creating cool content, your content is so deep and so thoughtful. And so one question we got from the MLOps community, uh, from, from the Slack MLOps community is, how do you go about evangelizing MLOps to your collaborators and customers? Do you have any advice that will help others out there be good at this task okay you'll feel like you set me up for this it's just like okay i don't think i'm like the top evangelist i think there's so many amazing people like you mentioned even general he creates so much content there's so many like you create incredible content you have you like you consistent you i feel like i'm more like a, a casual <laughs> like i don't i don't do a, um i do i do enjoy learning i think maybe that's that's something i feel um for me I, I don't think of it as like evangelism for me. It's more, I, that's a topic I want to learn. And it just happens that for me, one, one, one good way for me to learn is to try to talk to other people about it and try to summarize. And um, yeah, so I thought um, whenever I write a little bit of a topic, I first talk to people and then I make note and then I try to organize. And in the process, like, oh, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. So, and then I get feedback from other people and then when I publish it, I get a lot more feedback. So it's just a way to learn. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's just super helpful. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that are that are writing and authoring content, but one of the what always strikes me as Dimitrio says is, you know, how deep you go into pulling together what it is you pull together and how much structure you place um, on very novel topics, right? Or or very you know, cutting edge topics. For example, your pieces on streaming ML or how to approach ML systems design. And, you know, I'm kind of curious, you know, in the process of your own learning, let's say, you know, you're learning about a new topic. At what point do you go about pulling together these posts? How do you do it? What's your system, right? I I think people like hearing these kinds of things. I'm kind of curious if you could share with us. So, oh, this this is interesting. Um, So I do think it's like there is certain... I, I, okay, so like, let's be frank. Like, we like attention, right? Uh, there are points when it was just like, I haven't written anything for so long. Should I just pour something? Because you kind of miss the attention that like you want, but, but then you need to fight it. So for me, like, if sometimes I think like this way a few months ago, I had this idea, it's like a popular topic, but then it didn't feel genuine to me because like, oh, okay, it's not, doesn't feel like it's a topic that I'm actually interested in, but I, 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 write it because I feel like, oh, this is because I think other people are interested in it. And then I didn't end up by not publishing it. Um, because so, so for me, like there was a process, I first have to be very interested in the topic itself. So like I think streaming and I was super cool, uh, compiler, it was super cool. And, um, I do think it's the best time to write about a topic is when you're learning about it, because then you have this like beginner eyes. So a lot of things that don't make sense to you might not also like a lot of things that seem confusing to to me might also be confusing to other people as well. So so I try to make notes. So I think all my posts have another idea of learning about the topic. So like feedback much appreciated. And then I try to hunt down people that I think who are the best in the topic. If you ask my friends, so like um I guess it's I think you just I do a lot of like brainstorming. Like I just go to friends like, hey. What do you think about this? Like, first of all, like, if I were to talk to you too in a coffee, it's like, hey, have you heard about data contract recently? Because I'm thinking about like schema stuff, evolution. And if they're interested, they would pick up and they're going like, to talk about it. If, if, then they would say, okay, you know what? I'm actually like, thinking of making some note about it. Like, can I share it with you? And they were like, yeah, sure. Because like, if they're interested, then they would. Or like, uh, they're going to, like, hey, you should, or they might say, like, hey, you should talk to other people like this or person A or B or C because they're also in a similar field. Um, and that is a process. It did take me like months to write about something because I, I would, I would imagine it would take that long to really understand a topic. Ooh, I love that. So it's almost like a collaboration and it is a collective type of learning. And also the idea of going out and writing about a topic as you're learning it is so true because you see things with those fresh eyes and others who are getting into it and diving in, they probably, like you said, have the same questions as they are trying to navigate the space. And so it's like you are making a roadmap for them and you're carving out a trail in the jungle. Of okay, you're, like, you're really setting me up. Okay, like, I feel like I feel <laughs> nervous. Because I, I feel like when you have too much expectation on the result, you, you get scared. Like for me, I feel like if it was like, oh, I'm right, right, and I want to be a roadmap for other people, it's like it's a lot of responsibility. Mm. And I just Another afraid that if I do that, it would never finish because it would never be perfect. Interesting. So just keeping it very low key and realizing that, okay, maybe these are notes, maybe this will evolve into a blog post, maybe it will evolve into a whole book. Um, but you don't have expectations when you start out and you set off on the journey of what it will become. That being said, you did write a book. So (laughs) I imagine at some point you had to make the decision that, okay, this is, there's enough here. I know enough about this that I think I could put it in a book. How did that go? Um, I'll be sure to say something. No, I was just saying good point. Good okay. point, Demetrius. So you can call. And, uh, you know, same question about your courses, right? I saw, you know, you've written books, you've taught courses at Stanford, multiple. You know, how did that, how did those sort of more structured, um, maybe less exploratory sort of mm. sort of uh, projects come about? Yeah, so I think um, 
it's, it's also books or courses are also just way to learn. I'm not sure if I ever thought, so I think it may be tangential, uh, but I'm not sure ever, if you ever thought about like what would be some most important things for, for you to optimize for as a person. So, so I think I had been having this conversation with myself, I guess, when it was, I was like, the, the most important thing for me is to like personal development. Like if you treat, I don't know, it's just, um, so, so I feel like everything I want to do is like to see like self progress. And, um, and I think a lot of this is stem from like what would put me in a situation when I'm forced to learn the most. So the first course I taught, um, was not really, it wasn't meant to be a course. So it was back in, um, summer 2016, you know, like, uh, TensorFlow was just out, just came out and it was very exciting. And I did it easy for my internship and it was great. And it was just like, oh, I want you to learn more about it. So I went back to school and I talked to my professors and it was like, Hey, can you like teach a course on like TensorFlow? Because I really want you to learn about it. And they were like, I, I don't have time for it. Um, and, and so somebody just kept talking to people like, Hey, do you want to form a book group, like study group on TensorFlow? And somebody will give me an idea like, Hey, do you know what is this like idea of like student initiated course where you can actually propose a course to stand for instead of let you like give you a, a classroom. So you can, so, so it, it started out as like a work group, like a way for us to study together. And it evolved into like a course because somebody needed to, I'm not, have you done a reading group? Like when people are supposed to read a paper together? But we end up yeah, one person yeah. having to like prepare everything about that paper and present. So I guess like that was like how, how that became. So I think it's just as a very natural progression. I didn't think, I don't think I was qualified to teach. Yeah, no, um, definitely not. But I think the key for me was like having a lot of people who were willing to help. Maybe because I think maybe there's I come from a place when it's very okay to ask for help. I know like, I talk to friends here and sometimes it was like, it's just very weird because they think about something, but they just don't really ask people to help them with their questions. And I don't know why. I really appreciate the, the transparency and the honesty about, you know, how prepared you might feel and how, how much of a learning journey it is for you because I think it's valuable for others to hear that, that you don't necessarily have to feel like an expert to develop expertise. And that's often part of the journey um, is to, to allow that curiosity to let you, you know, figure things out. Um, and Demetrius. letting something become a forcing function for you to have to grow more because you basically set yourself up and you're saying, okay, how can I, like you said, how can I put myself in situations where I'm going to learn the most? That is a really great way of explaining something that I also feel like uh, is, it's something I have and I like to do. And maybe I don't necessarily consciously think about it all the time, but I really appreciate the way you put that into words and you say, okay, this is something that I know if I go do this, it's going to make me have to learn. It's going to make me have to become better at whatever it may be that I'm trying to, I set a goal for something. And so you're in a way just, uh, I don't want to say it's like assuring the success, but it is um, helping making that, that become more of a, hmm, how can I put this? you are in a way assuring the outcome. And so I, I like that you're doing that. Now, when it comes to what you've talked about a lot online, I want to dig into some of this because I think there's the whole streaming ecosystem is pretty crazy to understand right now. And real time is something you've talked about a lot. There's probably like the easy question that I wanted to get into, which is, is real time, when is it not needed to use real time? And I think that I see a lot of people quoting and I've seen one of your uh, pieces of work that's talking about how machine learning is going real time. Now, a lot of stuff doesn't need that extra complexity, right? So yeah. when would you want that extra complexity and when would you not so that's the first assumption here that streaming means extra complexity 
I do think that like new technology is gonna get simpler over time. So I'm not sure it's gonna be like even more HR complexity. And the question is like in what use cases we don't need um, stream a real time. And the question is is like when do you not want to access data as it comes? Like for example, if you want to go to I don't know like become an archaeologist and dig up something from like 10,000 years ago, then you probably don't need streaming data, right? Because the data is just there. It's just like, it's the way it is. It's not going but anywhere. Was, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think like, it's just information, right? I think, um, I, I, I think we, we, I do see that like as, um, we tend to have, to, uh, we, we, a lot of people like to have access to things fast. Like before, we could pretty just like, you send mail, like snail mail, and then we're like, no, I want email. And then even email was too slow. I want something like very, very fast, like instant. And I do think that people tend to like like things that are faster. And the same thing with data. I mean, it's real time streaming data is just like, yes, data is just happening right now. Instead of having to wait. And even the delay doesn't seem big deal, like maybe like a few hours a day. But I mean, like if you can access it right now, then why wait? So you mentioned how the assumption is that streaming adds extra complexity yeah would you say right now because and then you also said that down the line it's not going to be like that but right now do you feel like we're at a state where we can safely say streaming and going real time doesn't add extra complexity or is that something that needs a few more years or a few more months to actually be able to say that um, I do see that adoption goes hand in hand with availability of tool of tooling. So we do see the companies, uh, for example, they say, "Hey, we have these problems," and we look around and there's no good tool to address that. Then they are not gonna move forward because it's too much effort for them to build something in house, right? But we do see that maybe if there are tools and people say, "Okay, now I can just like install, pip install it, and it can just work," then I do see that might push that adoption more and it's like it's a feedback loop right so um i do think it's like so so that's one of the reasons so we, we start a company on in the space and the questions we did have was are we too early in the market but then we do do things it's like we can also okay i'm, I'm not saying that it's not like very uh but there's a chance just like maybe if we can build something that is extremely easy to use then maybe we can't make it not too early anymore. I like that. I like the way you put that, you know, a tool, you know, tools help drive adoption, right? I think that's sort of, sort of you know, one of your contentions there. Um, yeah. And one of the things I'm thinking about as you say that is, you know, you wrote sort of a famous blog post about how, you know, there are 200 plus machine learning tools that are out there. You know, yeah. you've worked at a tool company in Snorkel. You're now running a tool company. You have a lot of expertise in terms of just like thinking in terms of machine learning systems. Tell us some of the things that you think a lot of tool-focused companies get wrong right now. What are some of the oh. things that are not being done well? Some of the mistakes that are being made how that should be avoided. Yeah. How to offend everyone in a single like podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just curious, just curious. You don't have to say um, any names. I think um, maybe like, not what other companies are doing wrong. I do think that um, a lot of them are incredible. Sure. And I do think it's like as I'm studying um, a company and I'm trying to build a tool, I appreciate that process a lot more. It like give me a new light to appreciate it well. Like a lot of time I look at it, yes, it's so easy. Like just the idea that seems so easy. Like why this company? Like, I mean, if you didn't really appreciate like how, the tools, my God, adoptions and like how the design process. But now I just like appreciate. So I feel like every company out there uh, is doing like really amazing as long as they're still alive. That That is like already like amazing. Uh, I can share that a lot of like our mistake ourselves um, because I'm, I'm a first time founder. I've seen it at uh, other companies. Um, um, yeah, not just like the company I worked at before, but like I also do help like uh, advise like a few other companies. Um, and um, also like this own personal um is like a uh, claypot is you know originally we as as engineer I did not think about all the non engineer stuff that is very boring. But then one thing I realized was like 
building or selling a company if you're just not building a product, but you're building a company. I never appreciate how much work it is like outside a product because, like, for example, I mean, like, okay, we need people. And I was like, oh, wait a second, we don't even have the hiring process. Like, we don't even have like the, because it's very easy to complain how broken the hiring process that other companies are. But sometimes it's just like, when you had to build those services, really, like, okay, what, what, do, what do we do? It's just like, how do we make sure that this hiring process is better than all the hiring processes that we complained about before? Um, so that's one thing. Um, when you go to a product, um, it's, it sounds very easy. Like, hey, talk to users, get feedback, and iterate. It just sounds so easy. But if you talk to 100 people, they're going to tell you 100 things. And how, how do you know like, who to listen to? I think the hard part is not that you talk to people, but like, you decide like, what to take into account. And like, even if you listened, and then how do you like, translate that into engineering um, milestones? Oh, so, yeah. so I think that, that is a lot of learning because you have to balance between the like, opinions and data. I think um, sometimes it's like, okay, we need more data to make decisions, but you don't have like forever to, to wait for, for data. So you just need to like make decisions. And then I have all the guys sell down. It's like, how weird, how do I know that this is the right decisions? It's, yeah, so I feel like it's, it's tough. It's a tough world out there. Yeah, the... You're building culture, you're building a product, you're building a company. It is, there's so many things to keep in mind and also how you're incentivizing people. Like if you go out and have a sales team, you, you the incentives you give the sales team are going to make them, it's going to create certain actions for them that could be different if you had different incentives or same goes with marketing. And so it's fascinating to think about and... Uh, I, I, going, I have a question there, oh, actually, yeah. that I wanted to dive into. Interviews. <laughs> you wrote a famous piece about ML interviews, yeah. you know, guides to them. You know, it's something I actually looked at when I was preparing for machine learning interviews for thank you for writing it. <laughs> what are some of the things that, okay, I'm not going to ask you what people do wrong, but what are the, some of the things that you think that, you focus more on than maybe others or some of the things, some areas where you may have reinvented the interview process, you know, yourself and running your own company now that you're on the other side of the table. So I do think that um, the interview process is very personal, which is very weird, personal to both the candidate and the interviewer. So, so here, so like, so my girlfriend and I, we come from very different backgrounds. So he led the streaming team at Netflix. He's very experienced. Um, he has interviewed a ton of like senior, very experienced engineers, right? And me, I'm like, I'm like I went to college, I graduated college, I worked for a few years, and I started a company. Like, I've never reached my staff level machine learning engineers. So what does that mean? Is that like for me, I have this personal belief that, okay, if you're young, you're smart, and you're motivated, you don't get things done, right? So that was my personal belief. But then at the same time, there are a lot of like fine, like more complex technical details. It's just like, yes, you can, you're young, you're smart, you're motivated, you can learn. But like, how long does it take you to learn? And as a startup, you just sometimes just don't have time to wait forever mm. for a person to learn. So, so that was a difficult decision, right? Like, beginning, it was like, yes, I want, I don't care how many, how many years of experience someone has. As long as the person is smart and motivated, like we care a lot about that. But then I was like, wait, but yes, but like, do we like, so, so I think we need to balance out um, our belief. Yeah. Finding someone if they're already there or if you, they need to train to get there. And so I think, that, yeah. so I think that's something like we really like hiring is making a bet on, on the, on the person. Like every hire is a bet. So yeah, and then like, luckily at a startup, I guess you can edit the team quickly, right? But it still is painful, not only on the emotional the level. Uh, I mean, like you can, if you do make a, if you feel like somebody is not right for the team, you can change that dynamic. And it's not, okay, okay. I think it's very hard because like as a team, you bring on someone. Do you, 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 you meet them like a, like, yes, we bring you on, you on because we want to build a company with you. 
you are one of us, right? And people join because they feel like they're joining this cause together. And if you let go of someone like, okay, so if you a hundred person company and if you let go of one person, just one percent, if you are a 10 person company and let go of one person is 10%. And it's very clear. It's very obvious. Like it's not something that like, okay, the next day this person doesn't show up. So no way is noticed. It's like everyone's a notice. And it's when you let go of one person, it's not just a person. Everyone's going to wonder, am I next? Because you feel like, because you work so closely with each other, you know, it's just so well, it's a personal connection. It's, it's not it's not easy to edit a team. Yeah, I think, I feel like I, I also, so I see that side of things. And I also see the other side when I've noticed if I'm working with someone on my team and they aren't really putting in the amount of work that I'm putting in, if I am... I love the company that I'm working for and I'm putting in these blood, sweat, and tears. And then I look to the left of me and I see someone that is not as invested as I am. If they get edited out of the team and they they get uh, let go, I'm almost, it's not that I'm happy for that, but I do feel like, okay, let's bring on someone that is more of at the same level that I'm at. Because otherwise, if one person is able to do that it it in a way feels like you can sometimes not all the time obviously have the team be dragged down so i understand the sentiment um i do think that's like for a startup you have a certain amount of like failure budget so yes even if you bring on the person that doesn't work out is a hiring failure is is like you made the wrong bet and that's a failure so yes you can correct that and you can fix that, but it counts to work with the number of mistakes you can make. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's a very mature perspective. You know, I think these kinds of topics there, it's an art, not a science. Though science can certainly help us understand how to do art better. Uh, and I think I enjoy hearing it from your perspective, you know, having been on both sides of the table as sort of, you know, both somebody that's thought about like a lot about interviewees and now as an interviewer, it's good. It's interesting to hear that shift in thinking that you've had. Um, but without pivoting too hard, I really did want to ask you a little bit about your book, uh, which recently came out, Designing Machine Learning Systems. Uh, great book, very comprehensive. Thanks for writing it. Thank you. Thank you. My question to you is, which topic do you wish you had gotten deeper into or do you feel like there's now a lot more to write about now that you have the perspective of hindsight? Um, oh, man. Um, I feel like if you ask me today to be a list of topics, if you ask me the, a month later, it's a list of topics. <laughs> That's um, fair. It changes so fast. Growing. It's not. No, it's yeah. not. It's just like keep on growing. I think um, I, I do things as well or... Um, Yes, there are. I wish I had gone more into streaming. I wish how much learning. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a, a cop out answer. Um, uh, yeah, I think I do think that there are a lot more um, concepts that I wish I had gone deeper into. Uh, like what? Well, I don't talk about latency. And the book, in the book, I just covered a lot of latency. But another concept I think also very important is stillness. And it's not something you can trade off like latency and stillness. So, for example, um, um, think, uh, so, so, like, um, so, so, where does the latency come from? So, latency will usually define as the time when you receive, from the time you receive a prediction to the time, oh, sorry, you receive a prediction request to the time you return a, a prediction, right? So, in a very simple case, like batch predictions, you pre computed predictions. So like the time it takes, it's just like, okay, this is the time it takes, the latency is just the time it takes to fetch the pre-computed prediction. So that latency. But as a cause of like prediction, it's pretty still, right? So now like people like do another, hey, how about I do predictions online? But they're using batch features. So in this case, the latency is just like uh, the time it takes to retrieve the pre-computed features. And then the time, plus the time it takes to compute the predictions based on the pre-computed features. So that is a, so now the prediction is fresh, but the features is stale. So now people like go, um, and it's like, how do we make the features less stale? So, so people like do things, so maybe they compute features on a cadence, like in the batch process, maybe you compute these features every day. 
But in streaming, you can also compute features like on a cadence, right? So, so I say you can compute like for like every 10 minutes, for every minute. So, so, and as a prediction, I'm just special with this prediction, I like features value. So the question, I think this is one thing that makes a bear like, um, the barrier, like the division between streaming and batch really weird because like at on batch, you can also do it on a cadence and streaming, you can do it on a cadence. And not, uh, so, so what, like, at what, like, arbitrary boundary is like, make it stream or batch? Because you can do like micro batch very fast, or you can do like streaming like pretty slow. Uh, but another thing streaming can give it, give you, or give you is that, um, maybe you don't do compute feature value with every cadence, say you compute something like, uh, driver grading. So you can, you know, the driver rating depends on user rating, the ratings that user gives the driver. And so you can say, hey, every time this user, uh, user gives rating to a driver, then we just immediately update that driver rating value. So now there's like almost no stillness because of British M, if you meet the driver rating, it's especially this value. So now like this less still for the feature, but the cost of like, hey, you're going to compute that constantly, like a lot. But you might not, not every time, you know, you compute a lot more frequently than say every five minutes or every 10 minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. It's a, it's a fascinating introduction to some of the technical challenges that start to come up when you're thinking about, you know, the streaming paradigm, right? And what the kind of question that I have to you, you know, I know you wrote a recent post for, you know, streaming for data scientists. Uh, you've been very active about, you know, trying to explain what streaming looks like, how it works, and what its applications are. I'm kind of curious, where do you feel like companies or engineers still struggle to grasp? What do what do people what is the, the final thing I think that people still don't understand about streaming that you're still looking to explain? Or do you feel if they understood, they'd really get what you get about streaming? I think it's streaming at the core is a very, very simple idea. It's just like a pen only lock, right? Like you have an event coming in, you pen that, and you process that lock. Uh, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, like it's just very simple at, at core. So I don't think any conceptually it shouldn't be difficult. Um, I think like there's a lot of so-so. I, I think... The, the challenges could be, um, so, so like when we use some tooling and we get used to it, then it's hard for us to move away from that, uh, that system, right? So say like, um, I would say, for example, like, uh, do you use pandas? Do you use yes. like, do you use that yes. religiously? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I use it all the time. I use pandas all the time. Yeah. So, so, so pandas is great. Yeah. I would say there's just certain things about pandas that make it hard. For people to move away from the pandas paradigm, to understand, it's like say say like so in pandas, right? You may have a CSV file. You read from CSV, you have a data frame, and if you want to compute something like the average value of a column, then you just like use pandas, like something that count. Oh, sorry, not, not average, not mean. Okay, now I hope it's not a pop quiz because it's pretty wrong. Um, so 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 that so 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 I think pandas couple of three things. The first is the schema itself. The schema is described what the shape of the data. Like here is a, uh, the columns rating is a float, uh, here the, um, um, driver ID is an int or something like that, right? So, so the schema describes the shape of the data. There's a data source, which is a literal data that's filled in the schema. And it comes from a like CSV file. And there's another is a computation engine, which is like Pandas computation engine. And now I think you can put like maybe pandas to slow, some people switch it out to a dask, modern QDF, right? But a very similar interface. So, so now I have three different things. So, so now I want to go to like for pandas. Do you, once you read in the data, the data is like doesn't usually change until, unless you, you like manual add something. It's just a data, like when you read in the CSV file, like that is solid upgrade, right? You can manipulate that. But the data doesn't like materialize, doesn't like add, automatically add a new transaction uh, without your knowledge. Like you, you make that happen. So, so the other thing is like, because it's just stationary, you don't really care about schema. So find out this zero schema checking. So say like you have this data frame, you have on the rows, you like, uh, 
a reading should be float, but then if you add another row and you make that reading like shrink, this is nothing. But I was like, yay, go for it. Like do, do, do the thing. Like it's not going to stop you. And, and you see like that work. So it has stationary, but it's not going to work if the data keep on changing. Right. Or mm-hmm. why is a competition engine is very few people don't use finance. They don't think of a competition engine. Like you just like, I'm not sure if I would, I'm, I, people don't, don't tell me like, hey, pandas, like, you know, it's not something, I'm not sure if it's just me or you would think about that. <laughs> no, no, um, I think you're right. Yeah. So, so, so I do think it's like because of that, but like when you start to streaming, now it's different. Now streaming data is not stationary anymore, but it keeps on coming. You don't, uh, it is a data comes in without your knowledge because it's your understanding data. And because of that, you need to do all schema. Uh, checking and uh, also because of that you might have to do different competition engine because now the so day um, you might use a flink instead of like ray or a spark so 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 i think it's just like maybe if you can have some more abstractions like decoupling on the concept maybe it's could be things easier for people to grasp it i'm not sure hmm. okay i'm not sure to say make it easier for us to grasp it um i'm just saying it's like if we, we have a better understanding of like how things are, what things are happening under the hood. Then, yeah, so I feel like streaming, like, think of it like, instead of like performing on, on a fixed CVSV file, think of the CSV file, keep on like generating new data. Um, right. The data source keep uh-huh. on having new column. And that causes new considerations that we need to take into account. I love it. Yeah. So I'm going to change gears real fast. You mentioned in a this random is tweet. This monologue that you mentioned that I shouldn't go into. What no, was no, that? no, no, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was helpful. I think it was, very, it was, I think it was super helpful. I think what you laid out in terms of like how the problem, an analog to the problem in a similar the analog to the streaming problem and how it looks different in the pandas context, I thought that was really helpful. Um, so, so that, that was totally, that was a great, that was a great, great, great explanation. Um, but I think also, Demetrius just had a different direction. He wanted to take it. <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking about that, I, I like the idea of how streaming it is a simple idea or a simple concept, but then once you are addicted to a certain tool and the way that you're used to using it, and now you want to go put streaming on top of that, that's where it can be a little bit more of a headache to try and figure out, well, what do we need when we're using, like, I I, I need my Panda fix. And so if I'm going to add streaming on top of this, what does that actually look like? Uh, So, but yeah, I wanted to jump and change gears a little bit because I saw, I think it was a tweet, a random tweet, or maybe a LinkedIn post of yours. And you mentioned how China is very advanced when it comes to ML ops. And I'm fascinated by what is happening there. I have not been able to find anything or anyone that is willing to talk about what they're doing in China. And I want to know, can you like unpack what made you say that and and why? Just a disclaimer, that is a pretty much a personal opinion. I have not done conducted a nationwide survey for either <laughs> US or China. Um, so um, I do think a lot of interesting things happened outside the West. And I do think maybe I'm coming from Vietnam. I do think there's a lot of like Western centric media viewpoint. And that apply to a lot of things, entertainment, uh, politics, but also technology. So we do see that like a lot of countries that have very exciting things going on just don't really get enough coverage here. So totally, um, yeah. So so I do think that's like just like personal anecdote. Um, I do talk to. I guess it's just like I just has the impression. Uh, it's, it's hard because I mean um, I know that I got a lot of like um, so so I this is funny I mean, it's an anecdotal um, so so in Vietnam in our language we we say things that very in um, how to say in like not very like not very precise imprecise 
So we were saying, we, okay, it's like, oh yeah, a few days. In a few days, can be like whenever. Like, hey, you want to be at your house like tomorrow or afternoon? It could be like 7 p.m. and it's okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I think that, that is, um, but like when I started like coming here, I think has we get very, very precise. So, so that, I guess, is that good. I, I guess that is like, that's a good thing to learn that like you, especially when I want to convey an idea that try to represent a lot of like it, it's hard to make a generalization but i think it did um it's just like very personal like i talked to a bunch of companies and it just has the impression that's like they move way faster like a lot of things that it seems like my friends here in the different companies they say oh it's so hard to do but it's just like don't really want to go into detail like because too much to go detail i didn't get the same impression when i was talking to like engineers the same roles at companies in china so, mm-hmm. so it could be very much like selection bias. But then I did look at several surveys. So, like there's a certain survey that comparing the AI index in the US and China and also Europe. And I think that people want cannibal is like the number of research paper at top conference, but also like citations. And in that case, it seems like the US, like at least a couple of years ago, um, it seems like the US doing pretty well. I think you can see the survey later. But when you talk about like there's another um, di- dimension is adoptions. And like industry adoption, it seems to me like um, China seems to have a way longer adoptions. And for example, the percentage of companies that have been using the company at UAI for a certain period of time, it's just percentage wise. That survey show that it just has higher um, in terms of like yeah. industrial. Yeah. Production. Actually, uh, funny enough that you mentioned that. I was just reading today the state of AI report that came out. Uh, from Nathan oh, sure, yeah. at Air Street Capital. And yeah. he was mentioning how, yeah, the adoption has been huge, especially with uh, computer vision and the applications around that. So that's cool to see. And this is in China, I uh, I want to mention too. Well, so, uh, I, I don't think like the U.S. government has any program to do nationwide computer vision, facial recognition, do we? I don't know. No. Yeah, I don't. I think that would be very hard to get uh, the public in the U.S. on board with a nationwide computer vision, <laughs> facial recognition <laughs> type of plan. <laughs> Whereas in China, it's a different story. So the other thing that I was going to ask, I, you got to tell us the story because for anybody that's listening, Chip has an incredible like hundred things bucket list type of uh, blog post, I guess is what it would be on your website. And first of all, I think it's really cool how you are being very transparent about all of your goals and you have some just like top notch goals there. I, <laughs> it inspired me. One of them was like, get an ice cream named after you, which I find incredible. I think there would be so many different flavors that you could be. It could be real time chocolate chips, even if we wanted to call it that. And you can't do better <laughs> so, than that. I, I need you to give us naming. You can't just go with chocolate chip, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So Rocky it can road be, to real time. That's mm-hmm. it. Like, there Rocky Road to Real Time. That's the best one. <laughs> I feel like I once had this like Bernie Sanders ice cream flavor and did not. Um, it sounds very interesting, but it was not my top choice. Yeah. <laughs> so just, yeah, the the thinking around that to have an, an ice cream flavor that you want named after you is super cool. And I would have never thought about that for my bucket list. I'm also very vanilla when it comes to my bucket list. I try and think about things that I want to do before I die, but honestly, like I've done a lot in my life and I'm pretty happy. And so I, um, I can't get that creative on it, but you have one thing on there that I want to mention because I find it so cool. What's the story around, uh, being on stage with Flow Rider. <laughs> oh, so it was. Um, I shared the photos with my friends, and they were like, "That is literally the opening scene of West Silicon Valley, the, the show." Uh, it was. Um, so it was uh, at the Europe <laughs> conference. I think back in 2017, when the AI was its peak hype, and Intel apparently has Flow Rider introducing his uh, new chip. Which is very weird. I, I want to know what was going on in Florida's head when he went to this um, conference. Um, <laughs> but they had this. Okay, guess what? Guess guess what's the name of the of the party that Intel uh, Intel crew? Hmm. 
and it's introducing a chip. Yeah, so the two are party at Mirif with Florida. Introducing a know. chip. Um, yeah, give it to us. It has a gradient flow, but with like flow spelling Florida. Ah, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> gradient flow um, rider so so that was a story i think it was uh, just there and i think it was very loud so for i was like this is part of me was like okay and then he just like got me on stage <laughs> and then the next wow. day i went to i went to the conference and somebody was like oh you let us go you're a florida dancer okay <laughs> it's Incredible. Like, yeah, don't mention don't mention my writing at all don't mention my working out and all it's just <laughs> that yeah so you said earlier that you were writing something, but it didn't really vibrate with what your, it wasn't your soul's calling or you didn't vibrate with what you were writing and you had to discard it. What was it that you wrote and then discarded? Oh, let me find it. I think I have it somewhere. Or what was it about? Um, was it about crypto? Was it your new crypto mining? <laughs> um, so, so I feel like, um, yeah, I, I, I do a lot of... Do, do you publish everything you write? No, I have so Not much by any means yeah. at all. on the back. Yeah. What's the percentage? There, and people should be now? thankful that <laughs> I don't publish everything I write. But like, what's the percentage of things that you write by that gets published? 50, maybe? Yeah, I'd say 30. That's pretty high. I think yeah. I only publish like <laughs> so, 5% of what I write. Shit. <laughs> So I got to set a low or a higher bar for myself. My bar right now is quite low and I'm just putting out whatever. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's, that's good. I think, um, I think for me, um, I, I do a lot of free, free write. So it's just like, it's just some topic comes to mind and then I never, like at that moment I say, oh my God, this is so interesting. I must write about it. And then, you know, the lot of the time has passed, you've got into some other interesting topic and this topic didn't seem interesting anymore. And it just like did not publish it. Uh, wait, I think I have this, this like uh, chart elsewhere. I think I did actually like um, the secret to write uh, is you just need to publish it before you get bored of it. So um, yeah, so I, did, uh, I, I like because it took me it would take me so long to write that topic. I just sometimes I just don't. I just get bored of it before I finish it. Yeah, that's so true. And then if you go through and you edit it many times, then by the end of it, it's also with music. I find that where I'll be yeah. working on a song, working on a song. And my friend that I worked with, who was a producer, he, he would always tell me albums don't get finished. They get abandoned. And mm. that is really how it works in music because you just, That's at true. the end of the day, you're just like, all right, I don't, I don't even care anymore. I can't hear the differences. I don't know what, uh, you know, if you put a little bit more compression on that snare drum, <laughs> if it makes the mix sound better, there's just these minute details that you go into because you're so deep in the forest. And at the end of the day, the average listener isn't going to hear the difference. And so you, you just say, let's put it out. So I fully agree with that. Like get it so out there before you like, get bored yeah because you have some forcing functions right it's just like yes even though you're not very excited about it anymore it's just need to like push it out there because you made mm -hmm. a contract with someone or with yourself just to do yep. it mm -hmm. so speaking of this where are some places that you learn i imagine right now you still are are learning and every day i is it just learning with potential customers or people that you're interviewing out in the field. And I'm guessing that your learnings are also a little bit different than what they were uh, a few years ago, but where are some places that you're learning right now? So, um, I, it's also it depends on, on the topic. Um, so right now, a lot of my works, uh, I need to learn about on the stuff with real time machine learning, like everything around it. So a lot of um how, how I do have um people that I talk with regularly, the people I bounce off ideas with and who are extremely generous with their time and I always feel bad because I was just like, Hey, can we catch up quickly? Because I have some ideas I wanna talk with you about and they would like say yes and I always feel like, Oh my god, I never do anything for you in return. So yeah, so um yeah, so a lot, just a lot of people. I think 
over the years, I think I, I and so I, I want to like contact people as well. So I feel like if somebody writes something, just I find it, oh, that is new. I didn't, I didn't, it's like, it's all exciting. Uh, I want to learn more as an agent, reach out to them um, and, and try to find ways to just talk to that person. Um, yeah, so um, I think that's the one thing nice about like um, blogging, like writings and stuff, because I feel like if they have read my post before, then they are more likely to say yes to meeting. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yes, it's like, Young, like I was people keep uh, sometimes I always tell my friends it's like if they want to like writing is not the reward is not really um, getting followers because frankly I'm not sure like what followers <laughs> give you hope but like it's like the I mean, people know what you're interested in and they know like yes that person thinks about this topic uh, I, mm. I, I know what to talk to this person's about I'm quite socially awkward like if I go to a person and I don't know what they're interested in I don't know what to talk to that person about like mm. I, I don't know um, but if I know it's like oh yes they, they write about this and I can talk about this um, so that could be uh, so talk to people um, and I read uh, so when I'm reading this book I, I really like it's like complex adaptive systems um it's, it's some, something very random to think about like um should we go into it it's not, okay okay don't get me start talking about this i can talk about this for <laughs> hours so that's that is my weak spot <laughs> excellent well we'll leave that mm-hmm. uh link for anybody that wants to go into it and then they can reach out to you and talk to you about it <laughs> last question i've got for you before we bring this home it was one of the most upvoted questions when i asked the mlops community what they would like to ask you. And Mm -hmm. it is around your journey on being in and out of academia and where do you ultimately see yourself? What is academia? Is the idea to be a professor at some institutions? I wouldn't say it's necessarily professor, but yeah, someone who teaches or someone who writes papers that's what I would think academia or does research. Yeah, I think of doing research as finding answers to questions that people might not know the answers to before. And I think a lot of people think of research as like you have to produce something. Like maybe you have the answer, you have to write it up, and it has to be peer reviewed to say that the answer is correct. Um, I do think it's like for what we're working on right now is in a pretty new territory. So we are like looking for answers to a lot of questions. Um, we might not write papers, um, but we do some sort of like another knowledge exchange with other people who care about the same topic. So I don't think it's in academia, but it's a pursuing of knowledge. Excellent. Chip, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. I am Truly. so thankful that you came on here and you shared your wisdom with us. It's so cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and sorry about the name confusion. We, I re- didn't mean to be like, hey, we are against ML community. It's really just a lack of effort. Like it was really just like, we just <laughs> couldn't think of any name. It was, yeah, it was hard. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, well, hopefully, you know, I was, I was joking about it. And, but if you did, yeah, we'll figure out different names. Um, somehow maybe we'll change our name so that people can figure that out 